We know that unbelievers will one day stand before God at the great white throne judgment according to Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15, which says death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So we know the unbelievers will be judged, but how will believers be judged? By what criteria will God use to judge Christians? Will everybody get the same rewards? Will everybody have the same status in heaven? Or will there be different levels of heaven, different levels of responsibility? We're going to talk about that in this video coming up. Hey, my friend, welcome back to another video inside of our exciting series, Church Gone Wild, a modern day look at the wildest church ever. We're teaching topically through the book of 1 Corinthians. And today we've got an exciting topic for you. How are Christians going to be judged? By what criteria is God going to use to judge Christians? Once again, we said non-Christians will stand before God at the great white throne judgment, but Christians will also have their own judgment. It's called the Bema Seat Judgment. And we read about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it says, for we, Paul speaking of the church, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, I want to focus in just a moment on that word judgment seat. That is actually the Greek word bima or bima seat. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this series that one of the biggest things that was happening in the city of Corinth at this time every two years was something called the Isthmus Games. Think of it like the Olympic Games. And so at these games, there was a ceremony and the judge would sit on what was called the Bema seat. And at the end of these games, similar to the Olympics, the victors of these games would come and they would receive their rewards. Now, I want you to pay close attention. People who did not receive a reward did not stand or uh, they weren't basically in front of this Bema seat. It was only for people who were given rewards. And so this is basically the picture or the imagery that Paul is drawing upon to essentially let believers know that one day we're going to kind of sit before God. He's going to be on this beam of seat. He's going to be on this throne of judgment, and he is going to be judging us, not necessarily for the purpose of salvation, but more specifically for how we are going to be rewarded. Now, what criteria might God use when he is determining what rewards we are going to receive? Well, I believe that Paul paints two pictures for us going back to 1 Corinthians, the book that we're studying now, that will give us some insight into what God might be looking for. Now, the first picture is what I'll call the farmer. And we know that a farmer is busy planting, planting seeds into the ground. Notice what he says here. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believed the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted, there it is, the seed in your hearts. He goes on to say, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose and both will, here it is, be rewarded for their own hard work. So what are some practical ways that you and I can actually plant seeds so that we can reap a harvest and actually get some eternal rewards when we stand before God who will be sitting on the Bema seat? Well, one of the ways is evangelism, right? You're planting seeds in people's hearts. Now, sometimes we think that God is gonna judge us based on how many people we convert, or we don't convert, but how many people we actually lead to Christ. But listen, you may not ever lead somebody to Christ, but you may be the Christian who actually plants seeds and someone else may come and water the seed that you have planted. So don't 
put so much pressure on yourself if you are not the one that's actually leading them through the process of being a Christian. But if you're planting seeds in their heart, you don't know how God might be using those seeds and he might use some other servant to come along a year later, five years later, 10 years later, and water the very seed that you planted in their hearts. So evangelism is a great way for us to plant seeds. Another way is discipleship. You can plant seeds in people's hearts by basically sharing your experience, uh, leading them along the way of sanctification, and basically teaching them the things that you have learned as a Christian, making disciples. A third way is just relationships, right? Like when you have interpersonal relationships with people, your friends, whether it's a coworker, whether it's a family member, whether it's uh, somebody in your neighborhood, in your community, just simply having conversation with them, godly conversation, giving them advice, praying for them, praying with them. All of these are ways that you can plant seeds in their heart that someone else may come along and water, but ultimately God will give the increase. Now, the second picture that Paul paints here, and this is the one that we really wanna focus on, is not only the picture of a farmer, but the picture of a builder, a builder. Now, notice he says here, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now, others are building on it. Now, I want you to notice what he says, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. This is where I see many Christians going wrong. Paul said, look, the foundation for where you're supposed to build your life has already been laid for a Christian. That is Jesus Christ. If you are building on some other foundation other than the one that has already been laid, how can you expect God to give you a reward? Think of it this way. Let's say you buy a lot of land and you pay some people to build on that lot of land that you purchased. And six, nine months later, they show you this home, but it's not on the lot of land that you purchased. It might be a beautiful home, but you might not be able to reward them or pay them for their work because why? They built on the wrong foundation. And I think many Christians now are building on a faulty foundation. Let me repeat Paul says, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. So my question to you is, what are you building right now? If you look at your life, what would you say right now you are building for the next generation? What are you building that has significant spiritual value that will last beyond your life? That's the first question that I wanna ask you. The second question I wanna ask you is, are you building on the right foundation, right? Or are you building on something else, thinking that you're doing the Lord's work, hoping that God will give you some sort of reward one day, only to possibly later get to judgment day and realize that God isn't gonna reward you. Why? Because you've been building your life on a different foundation. Some of the faulty foundations that we can build our lives around are status or education, career, possessions, business, money. All of these things are good. But God is saying, if you build your life around these things and you go to him on judgment day and you expect to receive all these rewards, like, no, wait, I gave you this foundation I wanted you to build upon and you built your life over here thinking that you were pleasing me all the while you were building it around your own life. So I really want you to ask yourself the question, where is my heart right now? Like, what's my heart posture, right? A am I using my time, my energy, my resources, and my attention, and everything that I have to maybe serve in my church, or to use my spiritual gifts, or to disciple someone in my community, or whatever in my church? All of these are things that we need to be doing that would communicate to God that we're actually building on the right foundation. Now, let's say you are building on the right foundation. You're serving in church. You're making disciples. You're sharing your faith. You're using your spiritual gifts. You're active in your community. You're doing all these things. 
The next question that basically Paul asks and answers is, are you using the right materials? Notice what he says. But whoever, once again, is building on this foundation must be very careful. Careful to do what? To build the way he wants you to build it. He says, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, or wood, hay, and straw. Now, obviously, there are some costly materials here, and there's some cheap ones, right? So the question that we want to ask you is, are you giving God your best or are you giving God your rest? Are you giving God your absolute best or are you just giving him the leftovers? Is your career always coming before your calling? Is your family or your hobbies or leisure or sports or entertainment or whatever it is that you enjoy doing in life, is that always taking preeminence or precedence over what God is calling you to do? I believe the three ways that we can give God our best are, first of all, our time. Are we giving God the first fruits of our time? Whether that might be in our relationship with him, maybe serving at our church or whatever. Are we giving him our best time or are we giving him the leftover time? Not only that, our talents, right? Are we using our talents primarily for our careers, for our jobs, for our education, for our advancement, for our own personal enjoyment? Or are we dedicating? Are we donating? Are we using those talents that God has given us, by the way, to build up his kingdom? Or are we simply giving them to the world? So you have time, you have talents, and then ultimately treasure. Where is your money going? Yeah, we're going to get up in your business, right? Like when you start thinking about where you're spending all of your money, where does it all go? How much of it actually goes towards building up the kingdom of God? Now, he goes on because he says here in chapter three, verse 13, judgment day is going to come for us. It says here, but on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. See, God's going to be looking at, well, well, not just I did some work for you, but, but was it of any good quality, right? The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. So I want you to imagine that everything that you have done in your entire life is going to pass through some sort of judgment filter or furnace or something like that when we stand before God. And if it was done with costly stones like gold, silver, and precious jewels, then it's going to survive the fire. It's going to come out to the other side of that furnace. And God's going to say, you know what? Approved. I, I'm going to reward you for this. But if it's wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to burn up. But notice this. He says, but if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. You see, I don't want you to get to judgment day and, and, and not get all that God wants for you to suffer a great loss of reward. But Paul is very, very careful to say, you're not going to lose your salvation. You're going to lose your reward. Notice it says, the builder will be saved. You will still be saved. You'll still go to heaven, but you won't have the same rewards as somebody else who dedicated their entire life. Why? Because you didn't give God everything, right? But like someone, you say, you'll still be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. So will some Christians receive more rewards than others? Yes, I believe that. Just like some non-Christians will receive a harsher or stricter punishment from God versus some other non-Christians. And my goal in this video was to get you to have an eternal mindset so that when you stand before the Bema Seat of Christ and God wants to give you these rewards, you'll be able to be there unashamed and you'll be able to receive the rewards that God wants for you. So, my friend, if you're enjoying this series, if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, give it a like and also share it with a friend. Let them know that we're doing a series going through the book of 1 Corinthians topically. It's called Church Gone Wild a modern day look at the wildest church ever. We're just getting started. Look, we're only in chapter four, actually chapter three, and it's gonna get better and better from this point throughout the rest of the book. So I would love for you to go on this journey with us. If you wanna learn how to study the Bible deeply, 
I'm talking about breaking it down in bite-sized pieces, Greek, Hebrew, background, cross-references, putting a, t- a passage in its context and all the different things. We have an online course that you can check out. The link is in the description box below. If you want to study within a community of other believers, do me a favor, click the link below. You can also get access to our community as well. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.